All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to episode 102 of the On Air Advocate, where at the On Air Advocate, we look to provide education, support, and empowerment for all of those with different abilities, mental and medical illnesses, and their caregivers. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Tammy Flynn, and I am the host and producer of the On Air Advocate, and I am super excited if you are here joining us this New Year's Eve morning, or whether you are catching this on the replay. Now, as always, if you think any any of the information that we are talking about could be relevant for your circle, your network, anyone within your community, please hit the share button and share the love. So I am so excited today because as you guys know, we have started our reset for 2019 kind of focus series. And I have here with me this morning, well, two amazing gals, <laughs> um, but Miss Catherine Adamek. Um, she is a two-time Olympic medalist. She is a performance mindset coach, and she is also the owner of Fix Your Mindset. So, so excited when we talk about a new year, refreshing, re-energizing, and refocusing to have you here with us this morning, Catherine. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. <laughs> I know. And this is one of those days where we all kind of launch into that, right? We all launch into um, the start of a brand new fresh year. And so with that, every year, which is a tradition for me, I have some different ladies in my business community that come over and we do goal planning and um, mindset work and all of that together. And so my girlfriend, Molly, is here, though she is the owner of Pixology in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. And so she is here and I'm like, like, you need to join in on this. We all need to get in and listen to Catherine this morning, not just me. <laughs> we all need to hop on. So, um, Catherine, I would love for you to take the audience through a little bit of your journey as an athlete, as an Olympian, um, how mindset has really played a part not only in your career, but in your everyday life, before we kind of start to dig deep into some different topics that we are going to cover today. Yeah, for sure. So my story is kind of long, so I'm going to give okay. you a um, So I started skating when I was young. My mom and I, well, I learned with my grandparents and my mom taught, taught, me, how to learn, taught me to learn how to skate on ice. Um, and then by the time I was a teenager, I started speed skating and really fell in love with it. And so my story has two parts. It has from my teenage years up until my low twenties, where I lived and breathed speed skating and everything was about getting to the Olympics, winning that medal, um, really proving to the world and to myself that like, I can do this. You know, like I have something in me that I can dig deeper and push harder and I'm going to be good enough. You know, and I found that, I found that feeling really motivating. Um, and then eventually I got hurt. I pushed my body really hard. I pushed my mental really hard and I ended up with a couple injuries. And so I had three hip surgeries by the time I was 24. Um, I ended up being in a lot of, uh, just chronic pain, a lot of rehab. And that's when I really had to start considering like the mental side of things. And, you know, I've always been really good at pushing my body and being like really gritty toughness. And yet how am I managing the lows as opposed to be, I was good at managing highs. I mean, everybody is, but how do you manage the lows? I'm like, man, I'm really putting all my effort in and it's just not going the way that I want it to go. Um, and I, so I started coaching um, after I ended up retiring and continued to learn about mindset as I saw the, the dynamics of a team and how difficult it can be when one person's mindset is up and one person's mindset is down and how that affects the workout for the day. Plus me as a coach, if my mindset's up like how, or down, how am I impacting others just through the state of mind that I show up to practice with each day? Um, so about two years before the 2018 Olympic trials, a really uh, great friend and supporter of mine named Mark Carlton. He's a good buddy, and we were on the USB skating board of directors together. He'd seen me skate, and he just said, you know, like, I really don't think you're done yet. I really think you have more to give. And he actually helped me um, with some of the financial side of things to help me get back into my sport, get back into full-time training. And, I mean, one place that he really helped me in was this idea that, you don't have to be perfect all the time. The performance doesn't have to be perfect every single day, but you have to do your best every day. 
You have to be honest with what that looks like. You can't take failure personally. You have to keep moving forward. And so my dive into mindset training got deeper and deeper and deeper um, and eventually cultivated in you know, the 2018 Olympic trials and starting my own business and helping other athletes and other coaches start to figure out the mental side of their game in the same way that I've been blessed to, you know, at least learn. Certainly don't have it figured out. None of us do. Um, but at least learn how to get better at that process every day. So I'm sure we're going to go into detail on all the little pieces of the story as we go, but just, you know, quick spark, spark notes version of uh, how I got into doing what I'm doing now. And when you came back into it again and you kind of re-engaged and you had this new, this new outlook on mindset, right, as this has continued to develop, what was your game more like? You know what I'm saying? As an athlete, what was your performance more like? And what were you able to take away from, you know, each workout, each session, you know, different than before, I guess, you know, what was really the, the pivotal change of um, when you did install that more in your life, you know, that mindset and looking at things through a different set of eyes. Um, what were some of the, the big things that you were able to take away with each day? For sure. I think the biggest thing, um, it's, uh, I think a lot of people are, are hopefully going to kind of resonate when I say this, that a lot of us think that our anxiety is actually what motivates us to get the work done. And that constant like low level stress is the reason that we're so productive. And what I really learned through my mental skills training was I can be as productive and more passionate in my work with less ego. Just by starting to look at my anxious thoughts or to look at my negative self-talk and say, is this really serving me? You know, in the same way that I wouldn't uh, go to the gym and be on a workout plan or a nutrition plan for 12 weeks, in the same way that I wouldn't go through the full 12 weeks of that, and if it wasn't working, not make a change, I started applying that same thinking to my, to my mental. And if I have this limiting belief, or this negative self-talk or this anxious kind of voice in my head that's constantly pushing me to keep going, if that's not serving me, why do I keep listening? And uh, that's something I really like about mindset training. It really causes you to start to question, um, we have these negative things in our lives that we think are motivating us. We think they're pushing them to be pushing us to be better, but I promise you there's a way to be as productive, more passionate with less ego in what you do. And when you pull that ego back, then you really start connecting with people around you, really start impacting them in the deepest way possible. And I think that was the biggest change that fixing my mindset made for me. Um, in 2010, I was all about like, well, if I win all the medals, Right? If I win all the world records and I'm the best you know, speed skater there ever was, I'm going to inspire so many people. And I mean, to me, it always comes back to what, what's the good you're doing in the world? How are you impacting others? And I had this idea that by winning more things, by doing more things, I could impact more people. And then my second time through, I started to realize like, my medals don't help my teammates have a better day world record doesn't bring me closer to my family like it's my love and my process for what I do that lets me impact people around me and I don't have to cloud that with my ego and so uh yeah I mean that was kind of big picture and yet that's really the lesson that I learned when I started to break apart my thoughts ask myself what's serving me and what's not and then make this conscious choice of you know I'm going to choose thoughts that help me become a better person and help me impact others every day through that process, my speed skating will get better. But if I only focus on my speed skating getting better, it's very likely I'm going to miss the opportunity for myself to personally grow and to be aware of others and what they need from me every day. Right, right. And I think that, you know, on this platform, we speak a lot to the caregivers, the people that are on this lifelong journey of caring for their loved ones. And I think it's so important to have a good mindset and that outlook and doing um, different things that serve and nurture your brain on a regular basis um, to really um, 
have clarity and have grace with yourself and all of those things, I think that mindset is so important. That's why on this platform, I think the discussion, whether we're talking about, you know, um, business or whether we are talking about our families or whether we are talking about caring for a loved one, um, the mindset that we bring to the table each and every day, the attitude that we bring to the table each and every day um, really impacts Everything <laughs> attitude literally is everything. Mindset really is um, as the way that we approach it and, and we look at that. Um, and I know that when me and you chatted on the phone and you sent me information, you talked a little bit about an area that you had wanted to dig a little bit deeper into, and that was really looking at. Um, how we look at the, you know, difficulty in change being more of like a physical challenge, a mental process, the fight between that. Um, can you share a little bit um, deeper into what you, you know, meant by all of that and kind of break it down for us? Yeah. Um, so I kind of want to go back to your point about, you know, a lot of your listeners are caregivers. Right. And I think when we're trying to look at this process of how do I change my mindset? How do I create a better world for myself internally and therefore have a bigger impact on others? That, that, that's a process that requires change, you know, and that's, that's big, that's heavy, that's scary. So whenever I'm, you know, looking at a goal that I have and how can I change, or maybe I have a client who I want to coach through a big problem and help them change, to me, it always comes back to identifying that why. Um, why you do what you do. Um, I, I don't coach others on mental toughness in order to check things off my checklist every day. You know, that's something that has to get done. If I want to be a good coach, I have to do the things that it takes. But the reason why is so much deeper than that. Um, and in the same way that I'm imagining a lot of your listeners, like you have so many things you have to do, especially for other people every day, that can feel so big and heavy. Um, but the things that you have to do aren't the reason why. The, the reason why is, is much deeper than that. It's, it's a piece of who you are internally. And so, um, again, going back to mindset training, there are strategies for that. And something that I like to teach people is not that mindset training is, in, a, in and of itself, it's kind of an abstract idea, right? I can't tell you how to think. I can't tell you what your why is or how to bring purpose to what you do. But I can guarantee you that there are relatively black and white strategies that help living in the gray feel a lot more comfortable. And that's why change is so hard because nobody really likes to live in the gray. That's where anxiety lives. That's where uncertainty lives. Um, but there are strategies to help you embrace the gray or embrace that uncertainty um, and keep moving forward. That is so true. No one likes to live in the gray. <laughs> and I no. think, and I think when we speak to caregivers, so much of our life is in the gray, you know, all the time you are uncertain about your loved one. You know, what are those medical tests going to be? How is it going to turn out at the end of the day? Is that procedure going to work? How is it going to go? What, especially if you're in it for the long run, and it's a lifelong caregiver, what is this going to look like 10 years from now? Now my career and my job is changing, you know, all of those things. And so that does bring on such that, that level, um, that level of anxiety as well. And as a mindset coach, how do you kind of help individuals tackle some of that overwhelming or that anxiety um, that, that feeling when they are, you know, in the gray for so many different things. Yeah, for sure. So the first thing I like to go, the first process I like to go to is control the controllable. And so um, that sounds obvious, but I have a challenge for your listeners actually. And I really truly want you to give yourself a moment to pause every time you feel yourself stressing about anything, anything and ask, what about this situation can I control? What can I influence? What do I have no control over whatsoever? And if you make three lists of the, what you control, influence, and don't control, then I want you to notice where do you spend most of your mental time? And I, 
I can make a pretty safe bet that says 90% of your mental time and energy is going towards the list of things that you have no control over. And the things that you can control or influence at any given time is really only two or three things. I can completely control my effort today. Not necessarily even my attitude, because sometimes you wake up in a funk and you wish you weren't in a bad mood, but there's just not much you can do about it. But even in a bad mood, you can still give your effort. You can still, you know, like kind of tap into like, what are, the, what are the action items I need to do today to really make a difference? And then there are things you can influence. But again, it's usually only two or three things. Like I can't control traffic, but I can influence how early I leave the house. I can influence how early I wake up. I can influence how much time and space I build into my day to avoid stress. Um, there's just a few things, but we're spending 10% of our time there in the action we actually take and 90% of our mental time focusing on things that we really can't control. And I think that can be a really freeing way to recognize like every time now that those uncontrollable thoughts pop up in your head, you've already identified them as something you can't do anything about. So you don't have to think about it, right? Your brain will keep telling you because your brain is wired to make you think of all the things and drive you through anxiety and all of that. Your brain will keep telling you, you have to stress about this. You have to worry about this, but black and white on paper, you don't, you can just live in that gray. You can just let that thing be uncontrollable without requiring your mental stress. Um, the next thing is that I like to give clients is to expect the expected. Um, and so a lot of the times unexpected things happen and they're not that rattling because there's really nothing we could have done. There's no way we could have seen that coming. But then there are things every day that you can see coming. I can expect that my to-do list is going to be longer. It's going to take longer than the amount of hours that are in the day. I already know that. So instead of going through the whole day and going to bed at night, thinking, oh, Lee, I didn't get anything done again. I'm so, produ I'm so unproductive. And I, that, that negative self-talk, right, that says I didn't do enough, I didn't try hard enough, I'm not good enough, like, those thoughts aren't true. If we can start the day expecting, like, hey, I have more to do today than's physically possible, let me just do my best. Let me get through one thing at a time, one present moment at a time. And again, I just find that kind of freeing to realize that you don't have to be perfect. You can expect that imperfect is 100% reality. And then let yourself be imperfect. Let yourself be gray. You don't have to stress about being gray because gray is a reality. It just is. Um, and then that kind of leads me to the last thing, which is black and white thinking. And we tend, I, I think of black and white thinking as all or nothing thinking. And so kind of to, to stick with my to-do list analogy, because I don't think it matters who you are or what you do. We all have this annoying list of things that need to get done. Um, you can do all the things, everything on the list and feel awesome about yourself. But if you get 19 out of 20 done, how quickly does your mindset go from I'm awesome to I suck? From everything to nothing, right? And you're, you're imperfect by 10%, but somehow your brain interprets that as I failed, right? Like, that's not really fair. I got, I got 19 out of 20. Like, you can be proud of that. You, it, yeah, you're in the gray. You didn't make it all the way to the all, but that doesn't mean that you're not, because you didn't go all the way, that you're automatically at nothing. There's so many, there's so much space in between that you can learn how to be comfortable with the unknown, the unfinished, with the anxiety. Um, and learning how to be comfortable in that space, I, mean, I can't get rid of your anxiety. That doesn't, you know, I, I can't, there's no pill you can take to magically feel better tomorrow. But there are lots of mental practices you can do to learn how to let anxiety be okay. It doesn't have to run your show. You run your show. Right. And especially when you're living a lot in that gray and you're used to being someone that's black and white, black and white, black and white, you know, I think that um, it serves us very well. Like you're saying that if you get 19 on the list to be okay, you know, to, to learn how to say it, it's all right. And it's all right if it doesn't get done till tomorrow. You know, I lived probably the first mm, 30 years of my life <laughs> where if it wasn't done, I'd be up all night long and stay up till four in the morning and it had to be done and it had to be done by that time. And now I'm like, you know, in, in the world, does it really matter whether it was done by 701 or 401 in the morning? It, it, it's yeah. okay. Um, For sure. 
and, and knowing your circumstances that surround that and um, having that, that grace with yourself as things transition and change in our lives. Um, Cause sometimes it's not just us that we are in charge of, as we talk about as caregivers, we're in charge of, of others. And so that's unpredictable. For sure. Um, I, I, even though it's on a totally different level, mm-hmm. being a coach can be, I think could be somewhat similar to being a caregiver in that obviously when you're a caregiver of a loved one, mm-hmm. there's a lot, if that's really heavy work, there's a lot riding on your shoulders there. But the person that you're taking care of doesn't care about your to-do list. Right. <laughs> they, they care about their time with you. Yeah, they don't. It's very similar in coaching. Like my athletes don't care if I planned the workout perfectly, but they care a lot if I show up a stressed out mess because it's not perfect. Or if I show up like, hey, I'm here, you're there. Let's find a way to meet in the middle and get better today. It's not about me carrying my stress with me or my to-do list with me doesn't actually help me impact people that day. And that's why I coach. And I I really think that if a lot of your listeners practice what I call the five whys, um, you're going to find that deeper meaning in why you do what you do. Um, And so, for example, I don't coach. uh, I I coach skating in addition to my mental mental skill training. I skated for 20 years and my husband's a hockey coach. And so between our speed skating community and our hockey community, I do a lot of off-ice training. But I don't coach athletes to learn how to skate. I coach athletes how to focus when they're feeling distracted. And if you're doing that on one leg in skating position, amen. You know, if you're, I teach you how to think you can, even when you don't, even when you think you can't, how to keep going, even in the face of failure. If you happen to do that while you're maxed out on a hard set, amen. But it's not about the skating. It's about the skills and the the way that I can impact people to teach them how to be better every day. And I have to imagine that as a caregiver, it's the same thing. You know, you're not impacting the people around you by the tangible things. You're impacting them by the ability to connect with them as a person, to show them how much you care for them and to help them be better every day at the exact same time that it takes for you to be a little bit better every day. You don't have to be perfect to show someone else how to be better. You just have, actually, I would say that makes it worse. If you're perfect and you're trying to tell me how to be better, I don't want to talk to you. Like, I'm so far behind this idea of perfection that I, I can't relate. But if you're coming to me in this place of like, hey, I learn every day, I mess up every day, and I just try to get better, I have this outsider's perspective. I can see something that maybe you could do slightly better, and you'd have a better life experience because of it. Can I help you? Right. And yes, all ears. Please tell me. And so... Um, I think it really comes down to what's your deepest why and asking what that tangible goal is, asking yourself why that's important and continuing to ask yourself why the answer to that question is important five times. And eventually you're going to get to the space where it's not about, um, I can't reference a good example about caregiving. I I don't have that life experience yet, but again, from a coaching perspective, not about the skating. It's not about the single leg strength and balance. It's about how I impact people on a deeper level every day. And in that, in that way, I don't really get that stressed. I'm right. just trying to help you be better. And, it, and it's a really freeing mindset to go into and say, what's my real, true, deepest why? The to-do list is not my why, right? Um, it's just kind of a byproduct of my why. Um, and yeah, I'd love to, you know, hear from some of your, some of your listeners or even hear from you guys, like, how do you find that why? Like, what's, what's that deepest why for a caregiver? Well, and I, I think that from all that you just spoke of, I find that <clears throat> my, the mindset uh, that has changed over the last two decades of being a caregiver has really been that. I accept that there are so many things that are out of my control because you are dealing like you're dealing with people you're coaching. That's not Mm -hmm. you. You can control a lot of the things that we do as ourselves, right? We have a lot of control of the controllables of things we do, but when you're working with outside people, whether that be who you're caregiving for, your clients, the people you're coaching, you don't have that control 
over what may happen when your caregiver and, and, and your young adult doesn't sleep all night long. Well, you still got to get up and you still got to maybe go to work or get them to the doctor appointment or, you know what I'm saying? There's all of those things or the procedure that was supposed to take place didn't go as planned. And now you're in the hospital for an extra week. Um, right. I think that learning, what I have learned over time is that this is not, for lifelong caregivers, this is not a sprint. You are in for the long run. So if you do not pace yourself, if you do not give yourself grace, if you do not realize that every single day you are going to be posed with change and it is not going to go the way that you thought it was, you know, over two decades ago, I came from the mindset of having um, all business children that didn't have any needs except for, well, all children have needs. Let's just say that. They all have have needs. Um, But significant healthcare needs. I came from a space where very, 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 very black and white. And, you know, then, you know, over two decades ago, that all changed that picture. And it took me the the exhaustion to figure out that this isn't a sprint. Like I can't keep sprinting. I can't keep doing this and thinking that I'm going to change something that I have no control over, you know, and kind of relinquishing some of that control and setting myself up not for failure. And that is knowing that each and every day there is going to be change and I'm going to need to pace myself and I'm going to need to step back and say, it may not get done today. And if it gets done tomorrow, that's okay. Because the cards that, you know, have been dealt, you know, sometimes you got to take a break. Sometimes you got to step back. You're not just concerned with you. Um, Because I feel as caregivers, you know, we are caring for the quality of someone's life for the rest of their life. And that's a really big job. And so you know, it's a, it's a little, it's a little different perspective than when it was just me Or, you know, I'm saying just me married or, or, you know, kids that didn't have some of those needs that were going to grow up and go to college and get married. And, you know, the focus that I had as an entrepreneur, you know, at that time and how that's changed from being a very driven individual, you know, that drive is still the same. But I realized that um, there's a lot of pumping the brakes (laughs) and then I need better running shoes. (laughs) Well, so what what you're describing in terms of of black and white thinking. And I feel like what it, what a cool gift you've been given. I mean, what if you'd never had the opportunity to realize like, wait a minute, life's not a sprint because I love what you said. Like you have this opportunity to create a better quality of life for someone for their whole life, which in and of itself, I hope makes you question how am I impacting my own quality of life for my whole life? And that doesn't mean chasing the goal. That doesn't mean sprinting. That means giving yourself some grace and space to get a little bit better every day. And so what you're describing, that sprint, that feeling of like, I've got to get there. I've got to do everything I've got to do. And I've got to do it perfectly. In mindset training, we call that A to B thinking. And it's the idea that when I get where I'm going, I'm going to be so happy there. When I get uh, when my business earns this much money, when my kids get you know, this GPA or this recognition in their sport, or I earn enough to buy this new house, like we have these goals of tangible things. And then somehow we forget that the happiness isn't in the tangible things. The tangible thing is the motivator for our process. And so when we're chasing things A to B, we get caught in this default mindset of I'll be happy when I get there versus a different type of mindset, which is called expanding A. And expanding A is looking at, hey, I don't need to get to B to be happy. I can be happy right now. But, um, you know, I'll go, I'll go back to my coaching analogy of I don't have to um, be an NHL team head power skating coach to be happy. Um, I can be happy right now and also understand that someday I want to be really stinking good at what I do. I want to impact, I want to empower and inspire people to be better every single day. And if I find ways in my day to get better at that, someday maybe I'll be an NHL team power skating coach or sports psychologist or whatever it is. I mean, 
You don't necessarily need to know what it is to know that expanding my process from where I'm at is going to make me happier and get me farther than chasing some imaginary bee that lives on the other side of the fence, right? Mm -hmm. Grass isn't greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it. But watering grass is a chore. You do have to sit down every day and say, why am I unhappy? Is it because I'm tired? How can I sleep more? And then like you're saying, sometimes you, you can't sleep more. There's too much to do or someone needs you. So then the next day, are you having a bad day because you're tired or because you're thinking about how tired you are and you're, you're self-creating some resentment over your tired? It's not really the tired. It's the way you think about your tired. It's the mindset you approach your tired with. Um, right. Something really empowering from an athlete point of view is athletes tell me all the time, oh, coach, I'm tired. And I tell them, tired is a state of mind. You can choose not to be tired, 100%. And I mean, it's easy to see if you're, if you're exhausted and then you find out that you're, I don't know, your favorite musician's coming to town and you have tickets, but the show doesn't start till 10, that means you're going to have a late night. If it's something you're really excited about, you can convince yourself you're not tired. <laughs> convince yourself to keep going, right? So you don't need that external source. Mm -hmm teach your brain how to realize that tired is just a state of mind. You already know how to do it. It's just a matter of learning how to do it with less and less of a carrot every time and eventually getting to the point where the carrot is having a happy life today, having a good, being happy today because life's not fun when you're not happy. And if you're unhappy because you've created mental resistance to being tired, you can be more happy simply by releasing that resistance or by sleeping more, or whatever. But it's, the point is that there are tangible things you can do. You don't have to live on that wheel in your head that's full of negative self-talk and create an environment where you're tired when it's not about the tired. It's about what's going on up here. And I think that um, very powerfully what you spoke about, and I've asked this question, I guess in the social media realm before to others is, how do you define success? How do you define happiness? And really sitting and ruminating over that for a while and thinking, what does that really look like for me? Um, and I think it's because, you know, before I had my, my third child, my son, Marcus, um, that has some different abilities, which was two decades ago, you know, I was an overly, you know, going at 5,000 miles an hour, driven entrepreneur um, for every single thing I did. And, you know, you, you step back and you look and you're like, okay, so, okay, I have that accolade, like you were saying, okay, so I won that gold medal. Okay, I won that trophy. I got that award from there. At the end of the day, what do all those things really mean? You know what I'm saying? Because that happiness is truly derived from within ourselves. Success is how you define it. You know, it's not something that's on a piece of paper or an award that we're giving or an amount of money that we make each year. And so um, it's always a big question. There's a lot of people thinking about it when you ask, like, I don't know. How do yeah. I? That? What does that mean to me? Because, um, you know, in society, we have all these, I don't know, views of what that, you know, what that is. Yeah. Well, you're, you're reminding me about when I skated in 2010. And if I would have asked myself the five whys back in 2010, it would have been, you know, my goal is to get an Olympic medal. Um, and we don't need to go through all the five whys, but the last why would have been to prove that I'm good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a heavy place to come from, right? And to, then to go back up to the first why and think, if my why is to be good enough, is a hunk of metal really going to do that for me? Maybe not. So now instead of define, now instead of saying like defining my happiness by a metal, I can define my happiness by this feeling of like, not only am I good enough, I'm more than enough. I do enough. I impact people enough. And you know what? Even if I don't feel good and I have to lay in bed all day, my character, my personality isn't less than because of that. My, my character and my personality is more than enough every single day. I don't need speed skating to learn that lesson. Speed skating is the vehicle and that's the vehicle I took a ride in to learn that lesson. 
but the destination didn't need to be a gold medal. Um, well, I don't have a gold medal. I have silver and bronze medal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, not that I was ever unhappy in my pursuit of the medal. Again, it's just that the why for, for me at that point in my life was really, truly happiness was this feeling deep in my gut of I am so stinking good enough. Um, and for a long time, I chased medals, I chased world records, I chased recognition from others, I chased things, thinking that that would fill that space. And now that I understand that I can fill that space from the inside out, it's actually the fact that I'm good enough is what leads me to the external things. The external things don't fill me up and make me good enough. My good enough, my putting my heart out on my sleeve is what leads to the tangible things. And in that process is what makes me happy. And again, I, I feel like we're going pretty deep here. Like I, this are, these are not like surface level mindset topics. These are pretty deep level mindset topics. But I think that it's important for people to understand that you can get there. You can have world records. You can have all the things. And if you didn't fulfill your need for feeling good enough along the way, you're still going to have to chase that happiness. You're still going to have to chase the next B. But if you change your mindset to expanding A and you start to say, what, what's going to make me happiest in the whole world is to feel internally full, with, full of purpose, full of meaning, full of good enough. And then I, when I feel that way on the inside, I can start to project that onto my outside world. You don't need the things to feel happy. You need to cultivate an internal sense of purpose and meaning. And from there, cool things are going to happen. Oh so, sounds simple, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it has a lot of layers. I know that. A lot of layers for us all to work through. Um, Molly, is there anything that you want to add? be wrapping up pretty soon um i want to share just I'm taking it like all in taking it in <laughs> and i'm so excited because we're gonna go and think about what 2019 looks like mm -hmm. for us and and i really needed that refocus of energy and i had a to-do list <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all of this differently now that was absolutely amazing to hear what you had to say oh well, thank you I just had one more point while we were talking. Something else I wanted to say is that, um, well, first of all, Molly, thank you. Because you know, even though it's not about external things, it always feels good for people to pump your tires and, and just to know that what you do matters. So I appreciate that. Um, but I want to continue to encourage you guys and your listeners that um, for better or worse, so much of life is about repetition. And in the same way that I would never expect an athlete um, to go to the gym and know how to do a complex movement in one day or, you know, or to, to get infinitely stronger after one workout. But somehow we expect that to be true for our mindsets. We expect like, oh yeah, I learned today about expanding A, so I'm going to do that forever and I'm good now. And then, well, inevitably, you know, perfect isn't real. And you start to fall back into that default mindset of going A to B. And that's not a bad thing. That's a moment of repetition. That's a moment to say like, oh, yeah, that's my old habit. I recognize that now. Let me try my new habit again today. And it doesn't have to come with any of that judgment or any of that fear of failure. It's just as simple as the same way um, you, set, you set a goal and you take baby steps. And that's the way. Um, you know, it's, it's not glamorous. It's actually quite gritty. But uh, that's why it's fun. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes back to that. It's, it's a long run. It's a long yeah. time that we are doing for transition, change in our lives, um, for, you know, for getting to that finish line. Rome wasn't built in a day. Slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> yeah. We sprint sure. a lot of times we will run out of, you know, energy, gas, breath by the time we get there. So, um, Catherine, I am so happy and I feel so blessed that you have spent your New Year's Eve morning with us, um, because I know for everybody, it's a busy time and people have plans and things going on with family to do that. I want to make sure though, if listeners are listening today, they want to get a hold of you. They want to know where you're at. If they don't live in the state of Wisconsin, you know how they could still chat with you. Can you share a little bit of that information with our listeners? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I do, I do a couple of different things. Um, I do private coaching um, for individuals where we really dive in and do an assessment of like, where is your mindset? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your obstacles? How can we generate a process to help you, you know, get through that? Um, whether that's learning how to be in the gray comfortably or actually pushing yourself to a higher level. We, either way, you know, it's about what works for you. Uh, I do the same thing for groups. I can come in and do keynote speaking or group workshops on how to identify your strengths, weaknesses, and obstacles, and then generate strategies around that. Um, I also partner with a company called Vision Pursue, and Vision Pursue actually did all of my um, mental skills training as an athlete, and they have a 10-week performance mindset curriculum um, and if you want to make a big change, a long lasting, meaningful change, and you want to make a three month commitment to fixing your mindset, whether that's as an individual or that's a team, um, that's the way that I would say that you have to go because it really is about those baby steps. It's about having daily practices every day um, and not getting caught up in the end goal, but getting caught up in the love of your process. So whatever people feel like you know speaks to them the most, whether that's one-on-one -on -one coaching, group workshops, or that 12-week training program. Um, I'd love to hear from your listeners and help you guys assess which some of your core values are and how we can help you chase those down and have a great life. Um, now, is the best way to contact you through your website or would it be through Facebook? Yeah, definitely through my website. Um, it's www.fixyourmindset.com. Um, and then my email's pretty easy, katherine at fixyourmindset.com. I do have a presence on Facebook and Instagram. So my Facebook is uh, Catherine Reuter Adamick and my Instagram is Kat Adamick. And yeah, again, please, even if it's just a show, even if it's just a story to share, I love to hear from people. I love to hear about how mindset helps you and has helped others in your life. And so if it's nothing else, make a comment, click the share button, send me a message and just let me know how mindset positively has impacted you. Yes, and I will um, add all those links below. Perfect. So nobody has to search for them. They'll be there, they'll be easy and accessible for everyone. Um, so on that note, I thank you again so much, Catherine, for spending um, the morning with us. Uh, I thank you, Molly, for joining us too in here as part of our, <laughs> as part of our um, team morning. And if you guys want any more information about any of the services that we do offer over at the On Air Advocate, you can just head on over to onairadvocate.com and you'll find them all right there. Also, if you want to head up to the top of this Facebook page, and hit the blue button that will let you into our private group where we can communicate with each other each day to do that. Um, and this series will continue on. So our reset series is going to go for about another two weeks, two, two and a half weeks. So there'll be a lot of different layers to this from yoga, recipes, health, nutrition, um, hoping to possibly even have um, the mindset. What is the name of that company again? The Vision, Vision Pursue. Yeah. Yeah, hoping to possibly connect with them as well so we can bring all of this um, full circle. So any other last parting words? Happy New Year. Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year. Yes. <laughs> Happy 2000 and almost 19, everyone. I wish all of you a very safe and healthy night. Remember to please drive safe, um, spend time with your family and your loved ones. And thanks again, Catherine. Thanks for having me, Tammy. Have a okay. great day. Bye-bye. God bless everybody.